Hello, this is Jerry French from the Faith Family of Bartonville Baptist Church, opening God's Word with you. We are continuing our walk through the letter to the Romans. Uh, so the, in the New Testament, the Romans, and we're in chapter 11, if you want to begin to make your way into your copy of God's Word, Romans chapter 11. And we've been talking about what, uh, the, the, the letter tells us what should set Christians apart in the world. What makes a Christian a Christian? That was why Paul wrote it. And that's woven throughout the chapters. And, then the, and so a lot of these chapters involves exchanges. Uh, exchanging one thing for another to get this right thing that sets us apart. And uh, so as we move into chapter 11, I'm calling this uh, exchanging bad theology for doxology. For just how the, the text kind of, how it, it, it works through a situation going on in this church, this church in Rome, with these Jews and Gentiles working through the theological issues to move them to theology, to doxology. And those are some funny words. What am I saying? Well, theology, uh, when you break it down in the original words, it's theo is the, for God, and ology is for logia, saying, so God's, God's sayings, so study of God. That's because the moment you take one Bible verse and, and another Bible verse and put them together to get the picture of who God is, which isn't a wrong thing, but you just made a God saying, made a doctrine. Uh, even the people that say, well, I don't have any doctrine, I have the Bible alone. As soon as you take one Bible verse and put it next to another, since the Bible is not an encyclopedia, and since you've done that, you've created a theology. Uh, right or wrong. <laughs> and uh, doxology, then, are glory sayings, when you break that word down. Glory sayings. So, giving glory to God. Uh, oftentimes, that's what our singing should be. In our churches. So we're talking about exchanging bad theology for right theology, and so then the right praising, testifying, singing to the glory of God. And that's what we're going to have an opportunity with Romans chapter 11. And so if you've made your way to Romans chapter 11, we'll start in verse 25 and read the last portion of Romans 11. So follow along for the reading of God's word. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters so that you will not be conceited, puffed up. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it's written, written the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn the godlessness, godlessness away from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage. But regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs, the fathers of Israel, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. And as you once disobeyed God, but now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they too have now disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you, so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may have mercy on all. So God is, or Paul is, is bringing out this theology that, that, that all people, uh, God has worked particularly through Israel uh, for the benefit of all. And, and, and so we'll unpack that more, and that's what we've been unpacking in the, this series. And then he, in verse 33 starts a doxology, a glory statements. Paul, after having to unpack that theology, he has to move into, the, into doxology worship. He says, Oh, the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is his judgments, untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So that's the reading of God's word. What did we just read? Well, this mystery has been revealed. This mystery. A mystery that was woven throughout all scripture from the very beginning, uh, through the, to, all the way through the, in the Old Testament and then the New Testament. Uh, this mystery is revealed. The curtains are pulled back. This gospel, this good news of the Father, God the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, testified by the Holy Spirit. This good news that God has one plan of salvation for and, and eternal life, living with God forever, for all. One plan to restore people to fellowship, relationship with himself. 
one plan that came through his, God's promises given to Father Abraham and the fathers of Israel. One plan that goes first to the people of Israel, but then goes worldwide. This plan is, is entirely because of God's grace alone in Jesus Christ, so that no one can boast. No person, no nationality gets into this plan another way. This is the theology of the gospel. This is what really what should be creating churches. Why churches come together to worship God. Why we can sing. This is why we invite others. We do mission to expand. Right? Take this theology and see worship multiply. And so this mysterious plan, I believe, is the point of Romans. Gospel, the gospel is the centrality of the book of Romans, and it's the gospel's impact. And I would argue it's the whole Bible. Now there's alternate theologies that would like to see it other ways, and that's what we're going to look at. And so I'm going to have three points. My first point will be on bad theology. My second point will be on reactionary bad theology. And then the third point on doxology. All right, so let me pray, and we'll continue walking through God's word. Blessing, Father, I'm thankful that you are not a God of confusion, and uh, you are faithful and merciful and just to keep your way. And uh, even when um, man is doing many other things and uh, would be confused by the circumstances, even if you told us what was going on, that doesn't change that you are not a God. You are a God, not a confusion. You are not a God who lies. You're a God who keeps your word. And so help us to live in light of that and to bring that to be those known things, bring, bring what, what is known about you, what you want us to know, bring them to the unknowns of our life, and may that help us live humbly before you and that we would, would find that many reasons to praise Jesus. And so God, meet us where we're at as we walk through this word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, bad theology. Uh, and I do not say that word bad theology lightly, and I'm not trying to, do, to be divisive or just pure more correct, but the reality is we have to examine theology. We have to, whether it's ours or someone else's. Uh, we all have statements of about God. Even atheists have a statement about God. Uh, and so we need to have humility to, to be examined, to be tested, to be led to more scripture, to see where we've had things wrong, to have hearts, our hearts exposed. What are we holding on to? Why don't we want to look at that scripture in our theology as we develop this, these God sayings, how we live and before God? And so we're examining a bad theology that we may not have partaken in ourselves, but the world we live in has been greatly impacted by. And so we need to understand it. We need to understand how the people walk into it, and we need to just understand it. And, and it's related to this topic that's in Romans 11. And this bad theology is this. It teaches that ethnic Israel has been rejected and replaced by God and his plans. You got that? Uh, it's a, it's, the bad theology is that ethnic Israel, right, those who are, are blood, trace their family tree, uh, has been rejected and replaced in God's plan. And see, this belief has been in the world in, for a thousand plus years. It sounds a little like this. This is a, coming from the 1600s, a confession of belief in Christianity. Okay, This is someone who is trying to tell someone else about how they believe in Christianity. And they say this, I always do firmly and truly in God. And all the Holy Roman Catholic Church holds and believes. Okay, So believing all the teachings of the, the church at that juncture in history. And then they continue going. This is, this is part of the confession. And I am a mortal enemy of the Jews. Okay, that's in there. Now, this little confession, testimony of their faith, comes from the classic fictional book, Don Quixote. It, 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 this is, comes from the words of Don Quixote's traveling companion, Sancho Panza. And I, I, I point this out because this is a fictional book, but the author is bringing in nonfiction. He's bringing in the real world as he creates the span, you know, the Spanish background that uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza is kind of living in this alternate reality, uh, and all this other stuff's going around them. And, and so this was the real thing, and 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 the, and the author just makes this statement, just again, just bringing out this is what is right now. 
Okay, so I, I'm just giving you evidence that this has been, this thinking, this theology has been in the world for a long time. Um, you may be aware, uh, give you another historical point, that, that there are people who desire to erase or cancel, because uh, we're, uh, everyone, it doesn't matter what side of the <laughs> fence you're on, politically, whatever, the, 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 everyone is open to cancel or erase the opposition. And, and German, the German reformer Martin Luther Martin Luther led from 1483 to uh, 1546. Martin Luther's kind of come in the targets uh, the, of some people because of his view of the Jewish people. Uh, some claim that Nazis even learned from him. Uh, but the thing is, that true Lutherans, as the Nazis were rising to power, they were the first to sound alarm, really. Uh, they were bullied, first thing, because, uh, because they did stand in the way. They, weren't just give, they didn't want to just give up their churches to become Nazi churches. And then they helped Jews escape. And so, you know, clearly, you know, here's some people that learned from Luther too, and they didn't go down that road. And so the historian Carl Truman uh, points out that, that many people don't do a proper study of Luther and, and actually see something very interesting. In, in the beginning of Martin Luther's ministry, he started by trying to oppose the anti-Jewish sentiments of his day. Right? He started by writing that Jesus was born a Jew in 1523. So as, as he's trying to get you know, people to come back to God's word, listen to God's word, he, he even addresses this. Because again, this understanding uh, was so prevalent. It, it touched everyone. But then 20 years went forward. In 1543, three years before Martin Luther died, he changed his tone to match the culture. And that's probably why that pamphlet that's anti-Jewish actually becomes more circulated. Because, you know, people are agreeing and, and people buy stuff that they, they agree with more often. And, and so probably, if I could articulate it quickly, I think Martin Luther was hardened, right? He was kind of beaten up uh, by ministry and by the end of his life. But really what should shock us is in the beginning, he was trying to change the tone of his culture by understanding God's word uh, in this department, not just the, the department he's known for. So overall, my, my main point here is this deadly bad theology was common for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Because how they would say, well, well Israel rejected and killed Jesus, and so Christians need to reject Israelites. And so how this bad theology is getting created is we read more of ourselves, our culture, into Scripture. We ignore difficulties in the Bible. And ultimately the goal, what's the goal here? Is that we, humans, get to say who God's chosen people are. Who's God's special people? Uh, and so we get the power to say that. And then say who's not. <laughs> and, and choose how to treat them. Now, if I read all Romans 11... It'd be right to ask, you know, well, how did this become common? Because Romans chapter 11, verse 1 says this. I ask then, this is Apostle Paul, I ask then, how has God rejected his people? Absolutely not! For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So he gives his whole uh, family tree within in the Israelite uh, family tree. So, um... We could, we could say, well, you know, these people are just ignoring the Bible, but there is difficulty uh, because the scriptures use the word Israel to mean God's redemptive people throughout all time. Okay? There's times when you read Israel that it, it's not talking about ethnic, not blood, birth, nationality. In fact, Paul himself does it here in Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. He says, not all who descend from Israel are Israel. Neither is the case that all of Abraham's children are to his descendants. All right? So there's more going on when the, the word, sometimes when the word Israel is used. And that, so that's why it, it, this can be left alone and not just quickly thrown out. And then you have 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 10, applies Old Testament titles of Israel to the church. So Peter says to all the nationalities who, who are the Jesus' church, that you are a chosen race, one race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, one nation, 
a people for his possession. Possession, a people, singular people. And, and so, really, what you need is a theology that 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 accompl- that, that um, pulls in the complexities. How can Paul say? Uh, Israel, the ethnic Israel, has not been rejected, and yet sometimes Israel, when we use it, we do want to expand it out and, and, and touch more people. How do we do that? Well, we don't do it by creating this theology, uh, this replacement theology. This is prideful. The, the reason why it was created is so that way people could say, could control, and it leads to death, and a great gravity of death when we look at the Holocaust. And it certainly does not lead to worship of God. And so how do we correct it? Well, uh, we're going to move to point two. We're going to move to point two, and we're not going to correct it yet. Uh, Because the first move is is we actually see that there's a reactionary bad theology. That's my second point, reactionary. Newton's third law says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And I think that applies to thinking, too. Right, so I'm going to argue here in point number two that there is an equally wrong theology to point number one, but it's the opposite because it handles Israel more positively. But it's equal because it still does not lead to the right worship of God. It actually subtracts from worship of God. And so this reactionary bad theology is called bicovenantal theology. It could probably have some different names out there, but we'll use that one. Um, this comes from Douglas Moo, to give credit where credit's due, a, a New Testament uh, Bible teacher, uh, he, uh, professor, New Testament Bible professor. And uh, by covenantal, so to covenantal. And what that's saying is right now, Gentiles, you know, us, who come from a non Jewish background, the nations, we're saved by Jesus. But Israel is saved by works of the law, not by Jesus, in this time that we live in. Uh, so they have to go back to the Old Testament and keep all that. Um, and, and, and there will be a time uh, that we see like in the text in Romans 11, there will be a time when Jesus uh, saves people from Israel, but that's when Jesus returns or close to the end. And so that's where we get this two covenants, two ways for salvation of God to be in the world. And so this, again, this by covenant theology kind of co- comes a little bit from Romans 11. It's grounded in some of the, the, the interpretations that you can jump to from this text. It's found within conservative churches of the past. Uh, and really, it was challenged by Scripture uh, a number of times. Uh, that, that, hey, you know, guys, uh, you know, we believe the Bible, and we, we, we're not really accounting for what else is being said here. And it seems like we're maybe heading down the wrong path. And so there, there was some movements to make correction. Uh, around and, and but the thing is, it was kind of left alone because, as Douglas Moon observed about the 1950s, and I use him because if you're looking at me, hopefully I don't look like I've been around since the 1950s, and I don't know if he has, but he's been a little bit closer than me. And uh, Moo points out how Christians in that decade had a great concern to try to give Judaism as much space as possible, and that makes sense where they have a right concern because they're living in the post-Holocaust world, but. Here's kind of challenging. So even though people were kind of raising up their hands and questioning by covenant theology in the 50s, it was then kind of left alone because of their moment in time, their emotions, the convenience, and, the, and kind of give them control. Right? They could control and, and say that God has two separate but, but equal. And that kind of sounds familiar. Right? But, but that's essentially what they're saying. They're saying, well, God has two separate but equal chosen people on earth, and they're going to continue on two pass until God does this future event to bring them together. But you notice, really, the heart is the same as point one. Humans are getting to say, who is God's chosen people again? And so by covenantal theology, uh, as it shows up in various forms, this emotionalism, it does not uh, handle Paul's ministry, the Apostle Paul's ministry. How can you know about Apostle Paul's ministry? Well, You can read about it in Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 13, Paul says, Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, so you who come from non-Gentile background. And so far, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. So when Jesus showed up to Paul, said that you're going to go and and have a ministry to those 
who are not like you. You're going to go to the Gentiles. You're born from a Jewish background, but you're going to go to the Gentiles. And so Paul says, I'm going to magnify my ministry if I might somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them. Now, I want to point out here, the Bible, this chapter says saved and faith a lot. And I think each time you can say saved, like the way that you're saved is because they are led to Christ. And when we're talking about faith, we're not talking about a general faith, but faith in Christ. I think Paul probably realized if he wrote down Christ every time in, the, in this paragraph that he saved in faith, uh, you read Christ like a hundred times. So there's an implied word of Christ each time you read faith. So it's wrong to go on a path <laughs> that's starting to reveal that their faith is different. And so, because I can, I can say that with confidence, that, that I think Paul has this in mind every time, because we can read the book of Acts for further glimpses of his ministry. When, when Paul went into a city, he went first to the synagogues, so the Jewish assembly place, where they open up the Old Testament scrolls and teach. And so for Paul, he opened it up and he taught how Jesus was the Messiah, God sent one, God's promised one, how salvation, uh, the, the promised salvation that God was telling all the fathers about is found in Jesus. Now, some believed, but there was also enough of them that didn't believe, and so Paul was ran out. And so then he would have to go set up shop among the Gentiles, and, and literally, sometimes among the shops. He would start ministering. And, and he, I think he still had this hope that this activity among the Gentiles would cause a jealousy, a stirring in the, in the Israelites, right? That the Israelites in the various cities would see, hey, they have something working among them. Is it God? Is it Yahweh? Maybe what Paul was trying to tell us about Jesus as the Messiah was right. Maybe we should take a second look here. Maybe we should take a second look at the scrolls, the, uh, the, old, the, the old Testament. So Paul, we know, is doing that. So that's probably in his mind in, in the book of Romans, and it mean, that's what Christians are meant to be continuing in. And, and, and if we don't continue in uh, the ministry like Paul, we condemn a people, we condemn a people of the, of the Israelites, we condemn them with a life without Jesus now and eternally. And that doesn't sound very loving, does it? Right? Because who's going to share Jesus with someone if they believe they're saved in a different way? See the problem? Uh, Jesus who said, I am the truth, the life, the way, the only way to the Father? Is Jesus a liar? Is Jesus confusing? Or should we be taking Jesus' word to the bank there, eternally? And so, and then that's the only way that then Jesus, we, we, we start worshiping God in spirit and truth is because we, we know Jesus. And so worship stops. Stops. No matter how we interpret some of the events that have happened with the, the nation of Israel, which... Um, again, democratic uh, uh, Israel in, in a hot place. Uh, a lot of things that talk positively about them. But, uh, you know, no matter how you... They're not, they're not, if they don't have Jesus, they're not worshiping Yahweh. They're not worshiping God. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. That's what Jesus came for. And so bicovenal theology is really lasted out of convenience and emotionalism. That, that we humans get to say, who are the chosen people of God? It's bad. It's deadly. It's, it's not going to lead to worship. Um, and so we need to move to a different place. And so that's where we go with point three. Point three, well, we need theology that lets God choose his own people. <laughs> and then we need to observe that. We don't need to mean, uh, we, right? God chooses his people and we observe it. Uh, and it's clear, really, I think. So we're going to try to unpack some of that within Romans 11, and we're going to uh, look how that then just transitions into doxology. And so Paul is addressing the Roman church here, and uh, it's made up of Jews and Gentile Christians. Each group, I think, what we can kind of get a glimpse of, and, and even looking how the theology that was then developed afterwards, that in my point one and two, Right? They're looking at Scripture selectively. And so uh, I think Romans 11, that the intention in Romans 11 is, is as this argument continues, has been building, and now we're kind of crescendoing a, a high point in, in Paul's argument and in Romans, is really to show how both groups need more Scripture. And so as you walk through, the, I think there's kind of like three sections, if we could divide up uh, Romans 11, really shows how each group needs more Scripture for a fuller theology. And so I'm just going to very quickly do that for sake of time. 
Um, again, there's always more to unpack. This is one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible, so um, I'm not hopefully not being redistant, re, re, I'm making it too simple, reducing it too much. But I just want to kind of give you this overall flavor uh, to and move us into doxology. And so, first of all, verses one through ten. Okay, verses one to ten is a consistent picture that uh, that that scripture is continuing to be repeated. It, 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 God is being ever consistent each time. You can go back to Scripture and look this up. And what, what's, what's consistent about it? Well, true Israel, who are chosen by grace, not something they earn or deserve, not by, even by keeping the law, first and foremost. True Israel is by grace. And, and they've always kind of, God has made them stand out because of what he's doing. But then alongside that, there's always an ethnic, ethnic Israel that denies God's graces, that rejects God's graces. It happened in Moses' day. And I think Paul is indicating that by because in verse 8 of Romans 11, he quotes from Deuteronomy, a text that's indicating that there are people within ethnic Israel that do not want God. It happened then in King David, David's day as well. And what do you find? In verses 9 to 10, uh, Paul quotes Psalm 69. Because there were people who were opposing God's work through King David from an ethnic Israel background. They're denying God's graces, God's work alone. They were fighting against God. It happened then in Elijah's day. Okay, that's kind of the, the timeline. Now, Elijah is being mentioned in verses 2 and 4. But it's ever consistent. And, and so God, God's trying to, to open up both their eyes and saying, hey, this is how it's been taking place as we go on. And so, yeah, you see this, um, that there, there's, there are Jewish people that are coming to faith and some that aren't. This is what you've been seeing throughout all of Scripture, all of time. God has his heart. He's paid attention to Israel. And yet only a portion of those were really believers in God's grace that he alone saves. And so... There's, there's a degree like, stop arguing about this. This is clear from Scripture. Stop, stop letting this be a point to divide you, you Jews and Gentile believers in God. Stop. So God's doing the same thing here in AD 57. God is consistent. There are going to be people, his people are going to be those who look to him for his promised salvation dependent upon his grace. And, and, and there's going to be those people, and there's always going to be people surrounding them that on the surface level look kind of similar, have some tribal markers similar, and yet they are not believers. And you will know them by how they live their lives, ultimately. And they'll eventually uh, show that they are not dependent upon God's grace. No matter how much they, they pay lip service and, and fake worship of God, they're really worshiping themselves. They're rejecting God's graces, and while God is trying to be faithful and merciful. All right? So, again, he's just trying to, he's exploding an argument that's taking place. He's really probably making both sides unhappy, both Jew and Gentile, by unpacking Scripture and saying, hey, this is consistent. But then secondly, Paul then moves to the Gentiles in verses 11 through 24. Paul interacts with this, it looks like this imagery that the Gentiles are grabbing hold of from the, from the Old Testament, the olive tree, the branch. Uh, and, and it seems like they're boasting um, and, and saying that, 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 you know, God has moved on from you guys. Maybe, again, kind of like that, that, that theology in point number one. They're believing that, that God has broken off you guys, your branches and put ours in. Well, Paul reminds them, well... <laughs> The, if, if God's broke it off, God could put the, the natural batch back in. And really, this, this imagery Paul's probably quite familiar with is it's, it's very important. Uh, Old Testament, as you draw to the end of the Old Testament, you're waiting for the sprout to rise up from ashes, from ruin. And uh, like the, the, there's this branch uh, or the stump that, you know, this tree's been cut down, and you're waiting for a branch to come out of it that's going to be a hope for the whole world. And that branch, again, it's, using, it's a figurative, but it's really awaiting a human family tree to develop one person. A family tree of the Old Testament leads to the promised one. And that family tree, we see it in Matthew 11, Luke 3, contains both Jew and Gentile. That, 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 that it contains people who were chosen by God 
God's grace and are dependent upon God's grace. And it leads to, who's the promised one? Jesus. Jesus, who then says, I am the vine, you are the branches. You are dependent upon Jesus, Jew and Gentile, whether you abide in him. And, and that was the message that, that all people were prepared for as they had prophecy. Okay? The whole point of the Old Testament is that you need to be found in this tree. And, and so that's not something for you to boast in. You, you, you can make, take no credit for that. God's the one who's been growing this tree through when you think this family's going to be wiped out. Just keep it going. You uh, just need to focus on, are you found in him? Is that, are, are you becoming more like Jesus because you are so much abiding in him? You're, you're in him. Because apart from Jesus, you can bear no fruit. Right? No spiritual fruit. So there's really no boast, Jew or Gentile. Then you move into 25 to 32, uh, and again, he uses that mystery language. That This is the text that I read when we started. Again, this mystery, it, it's not like Scooby-Doo uh, and uh, the crew discovering a mystery. Uh, this is a mystery that's something that's been woven through the scriptures, and, and you can see it, but there's a, there's a gap. There's, a, there's something missing to, to really, uh, for everyone to understand it. And, but, so you, but you can see that here's something that's going on. And that there, there's what's going on in this, in this mystery is there's a linkage between true, chosen by grace, Israel. And I think that's what 1126, when it says all Israel be saved, it means those are true, chosen by grace, Israel. Okay. Them and then the true, chosen by, the, the chosen by grace, Gentiles. How even in the Old Testament, there's this mystery that, that they are really going to come together. They're going to come together. That there, there's a gap right now, but they're going to be brought together as they're coming near to God. All right, so you get this prophecy, like Isaiah 49, verse 6, that says, it's not enough for you to be my servant. So it, God's speaking through Isaiah, but he's almost like he's speaking to this person that's in the shadows. You don't quite see him yet. Who is he speaking to? Well, God, but God's saying this, it's not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob, restoring my protected ones of Israel. You see that? The, raising up the tribes of, of Jacob, restoring the protected ones of Israel. So those chosen by grace. But he keeps going on. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So the servant of God would do this both and work. Both and. Those chosen by grace Israel and those chosen by grace Gentiles would see the light and ultimately they would all be connected in him. And who's that him? Well, we have the benefit of being standing after Christ, don't we? But here's another prophecy. That, again, this is on the surface that, that people were wrestling with, the, the people of Israel specifically. Zechariah, another prophet, Old Testament prophet, said, you know, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies spoke through Zechariah and said this, in those days, 10 men from the nations of every language will grab the robe of a Jewish man tightly. You got the picture? People from the many nations grabbing hold of a Jewish man's robes tightly, urging, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Where else have we heard that word, God is with you? Huh, what is it? Emmanuel, God is with you. God is with us. So, who is it? So, this then goes all the way back to the promises to Abraham in Genesis 12 through 15, where he would be, he would have a nation, but then he would bless the nations. All nations would be blessed through Abraham, that's because we know, uh, and, and we can know that answer. Who is this? It's, it's Jesus. He, Jesus is the one whose robe we want to grab a hold of. Jesus is the, the true child of Abraham who can be a blessing to the nations, and we want to grab hold of his robe and not let go. All right, so God is doing this work. It's, it's been going on throughout to all time. It continues until God says it's done. And it comes along with this, the text tells us this work of revealing this mystery comes with a partial hardening of Israel. Okay, there's this partial hardening of Israel, and then there's also within the text this promise of an ethnic revival in the future. Or that there's, the, you know, yeah. Um, and, and, and again, there's a lot of debate on the, the, these words. And, and really, that's why I ask, you know, what, what do we do with it? Obviously, Paul's including it for us to do something with it, but what? But what? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
put the make it kind of simple, I'm gonna say nothing. Practically, we can't do anything on it. But say, this is God's work. We are in His grace, right? Because isn't that doesn't that put people the you know Paul's point of, of saying telling. People about this, in, the, in, the, in this third section, is I don't want you to be conceited. I don't want you to be puffed up. You know the best way to uh, <laughs> de- make sure we, we are not puffed up? It's not in your hands. It's not in your hands. This is God's work. Jew and Gentile, you're in his graces. Because really, because, okay, God, we're told that there's a hardening. A hardening means that the, the, the heart is hard towards God and not receptive of God's work. Okay, so we've been told that. So what do we do with it? Can we take any action towards people who are hardened? Not really, because there's an adjective in front of that. It says partial hardening. What does that mean? How, what, to what extent are, are, is, is that partial? I mean, is, do we need to go check people's back and see, hey, um, before I share the gospel, share the good news of Jesus with, with you, I need to find out if there's some kind of marker on you, if you're part of the hardened group or the revival group. Or I need to check the stars and see if we're, we're near the revival time. No, there's no re- nothing in Paul's language to help us do that. Or nor should we want to do that. No, we just know this is something that, that's taking place. And the only thing we can do is be dependent upon God. That fights conceit. That fights pride. That we can only do, what we can do is just step in what we know about God and then let him fill in the unknowns. And so we know Old Testament, New Testament, over and over again that God has a plan to save the nations. Every nation, Jew and Gentile. He has one plan. And that plan keeps us looking to God's grace in Jesus Christ. Right? In the Old Testament, they were looking... uh, uh, they were holding on to the promise of Jesus, not knowing quite who he was, but that was what they were being tested by. How are they holding on to God's future grace? And now us, we, we, um, we look back, we, we see Jesus has come. Jesus was the answer. He now defines us until he returns and, and then ushers in this new world when we have this perfection, the, the, the perfect uh, designs of God in every nation on display not for our benefits, not for us to say, oh, look at my nation. No, for God to receive the glory. And that's why Revelation 7 has this every nation, every tongue, worshiping God. It's for his glory. It's about him being on the throne, not us. So this is the theology that moves into doxology. Right? These theology, theological statements show our dependence upon God, and so then our theology, the, our, our doxology, what we sing to God, it's, um, we can't help because that's where Paul goes, right? We're not counseling God. We're not the ones meant to do the judgments. We're holding on to the knowns. And those things are supposed to be sweet to us, sweeter than honeycomb, more desirable. Those are the treasures, what we know, and they help us do the unknowns. And so that helps us sing and, and, and sing. Join Paul in 1133-36, sing. Well, we have theology dependent upon God, we make doxology, glory statements with the dependence too. And how much more can you be dependent upon God with that phrase that we see that all things are from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, if I haven't lost you, in this little bit different sermon, uh, uh, kind of trying to get the big idea of Romans 11 because there's just so many details in Romans 11. I'm trying to kind of be up a little bit higher. Um, not going into all the little connections, but hopefully helping you, showing you how theology goes astray when we try to put our, our stamp of approval on who God's people are, where we get to speak louder. Because really what ends up happening is we twist Scripture, we end up becoming blind to Scripture, and we really reveal who is the hardened. Who's hardened? Well, it's because if we're twisting Scripture or blinding Scripture, it kind of shows who is. And that will kill worship of God. Bad theology kills worship of God because it leads to racist practices. practices worshiping the creator, creation versus the creator God who created all nations. 
And so in our theology, we always have to come back and acknowledge that God's ways are higher than, than, than our ways. He's not asking for our counsel. He's not asking for our judgment. We are completely dependent upon him. And so when I hear bad theology, and I hope maybe I can impress this on you as an application of this text, when you hear bad theology, your goal is not just to swing to the other, the other side. And so if you hear bad theology coming from the left, my goal is not just to swing to the conservative theology necessarily. Because the conservatives, newsflash, can be wrong, can be emotional, just the same way as the left. So my goal is to, to maybe hear both sides and then really say, okay, you know what, I'm going to have some problem. I'm going to have to navigate this noise. But ultimately, I want to get back to Scripture. I want to work through what was missing in Scripture. What, what Scriptures were people missing? And ultimately, I, I know with confidence that's going to lead me to run to Christ. Because it's only Jesus Christ who can worship, increase the worship of God. That's what he was sent for. That's his goal, is to increase worship of God the Father. And so, um, because he's the salvation, he is the truth, he's the light, he's the way. So I let Jesus, my Christology, uh, in, in the fancy terms, my, my Christology, my Christ sayings, guide everything else. I, I let Jesus stir up my response to the present situation versus just responding to the right and left. No, I want Jesus, I want people to see more of Jesus so I don't care about the right and left as much. And, but is that how the church is acting? Is that how we typically act? Or do we just respond to one another? Left versus right. And so I want to challenge, uh, and again, I think this would fall, and I think conservatives, because we don't want to just be conservative. We want to be Jesus people. We want to be a different C. We want to be Christ people. I think we, we should respond to that. Instead of just, uh, you know, being on our soapboxes, we should want more Jesus shown. And I think this is an example of how we need more scripture. We need a bigger theology. We need a more Christ-centric theology Christ-defining theology. And that's the only way people are going to move from shaking their fist at God in anger to bowing in worship. Doxology. Only Jesus. And so with that, let me close in prayer. Blessing Father, I do thank you for your word and for your graces towards us. And may it help us in our days. And I ask this in, in pre the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. God bless. May the Lord Jesus uh, bless you with his presence.